I'd like to thank uh, the Irish Centre of Social Gerontology for inviting me along to present at the summer school. And I'm delighted to be talking to an audience of social scientists and with a large proportion of you doing your PhDs at the moment. And as Gemma said, it's a bit of a challenge when I know a lot of you aren't actually doing ageing research. Um, but I will attempt to convert you to, to gerontology. And for those that are doing ageing research, I'd just like to point out, this is the Swansea campus here. Um, and if you're looking for research posts after you've finished your PhD, please bear in mind that we do have a campus right on the beach here. Um, <laughs> our building is right about here, has beautiful views down with the Gower. <laughs> and we're constantly looking for researchers and ageing research. Um, as your, your research interests are quite varied... I might be introducing certain topics that those of you who are doing re ageing research already know, but I'm going to include a little bit about my personal journey as a researcher, um, but also where I grew up, why that sparked an interest in ageing research for me. And I'm going to try and relate all of this to housing policies for older people, Firstly in England, and then latterly in Wales, because I started off in England, uh, but my research career has been based in Wales. So in describing the innovative housing policies for older people, which should be my next slide, there we go, um, I'm going to refer to my personal life experiences as well as my research. So I'm going to start with a bio biographic background of my hometown Worthing in West Sussex in England. And I'm going to look at the demographic constitution and changes in the population um, of Worthing and the influences this had on my personal experience of older people and services for older people. Um, and more specifically, I'm going to be talking about housing. So I'll explain to you how I got interested in looking at housing for older people and then move on to look in particular at supported housing for older people. Now this, this particular address is about innovation in housing policies and innovation simply means the introduction of something new but in order to understand how new things have been introduced we need to know a little bit about the historical context and development of supported living for older people. Um, what we need to look at what went wrong or what was perceived to be problems with um, supported housing and then how policies were developed in order to respond to the deficiencies that people had identified and to move the agenda forward. What I'm going to do is refer to three Welsh research projects that I've been involved in. One Gem has already referred to, which was the Bangor Longitudinal Study of Ageing, and that started in 1979. And just in case any of you think I'm wearing particularly well, or maybe not, if I was started in 79, I actually did enjoy that project until 1995. But I had the opportunity of being able to look at all the data that was collected from 1979 onwards. Um, I'm also going to refer to other relevant studies, and in particular, Peter Townsend's seminal work um, on residential care. And uh, I'll be looking at this and, and how that influenced changes in housing policy from 1948 until the present day. So, let's move on. I'd like to start then. Oh no, look, I've already gone wrong. Right, that's it, I think. No, I'll do that then. Oh, my. <laughs> Try again. There we go, 1970s. Now this is a decade very dear to my heart. <laughs> and you can see I've, I've stuck with the Bowie haircut, I've not moved on. <laughs> but I was 10 in the mid-70s, and I clearly remember growing up during this decade. Music was great, and I think the clothes were even better. Um, Andy Beckett wrote in The Guardian about the 1970s, and he said, The British 70s signified both drabness and gaudiness, excess and shortages, Campness, blokishness, hippiedom and violence, tastelessness, stylishness, crudity and knowingness, a sense of possibility and entropy, hedonism and melancholy, austerity and decadence, seediness and a certain innocence. During the 1970s, Britain had four prime ministers, four general elections, five official states of emergency, two property booms, two oil crises, a riot of youth subcultures, I was in one of them up there, um, <laughs> and a pop music revolution whose cultural reverberations are still being felt. 
This is a population pyramid for the 1970s. Now, some of you will be probably familiar with this sort of statistical depiction of what the population looks like, but some of you may not, so I'll, I'll describe a little bit about what this means. This is a graphical illustration of the distribution of various age groups in the population, and this pyramid here shows the age distribution in the UK in 1971. The left-hand side of the chart, um, it, the blue bars, shows the proportion of men in the population, while the right-hand side of the chart, so the sort of maroon colour bars, are the females in the population. And you can see that in 1971, the shape's roughly, roughly pyramidal. This means that, on the whole, there are a greater number of younger people in the population, in that way, down here, than older people, which are the, the bits at the top. I remembered. <laughs> um, this isn't how I remember their population in the 1970s, though. Uh, now I'm going backwards. All right, return, that's better. Okay, that's, this is Worthing. This is my hometown. It's very different, as you can see, from the UK as a whole. The population, which was 88,000 in um, Worthing, is in fact dominated by older women. This is the bulge that you see over here with the red bars. That's the age band I was in. Um, and you can see that each of the age bands from 55 onwards contained a greater proportion of people than in my peer cohort. And in Worthing, two-fifths, that's 40% of the population, were aged over 65. And this is approximately two times the proportion that was in the UK as a whole. The average age of people in, the, uh, in Worthing was 47 and a half years, compared with 34 years in the UK population as a whole. So when people talk about the greying of the population today, they mean that in the future there's going to be a smaller proportion of younger people compared with the older population. If we move on, I can't do that, and look at the population of the UK in 2006, we can see around one-fifth of the population, in 2006 that was 60.5 million, was aged 60 and over. But the peak of population ageing is predicted to be in 2031. And this next chart shows that. This pyramid, though, de demonstrates that even in 2031, the proportion of older people in the population is nowhere near that that we experienced in Worthing in the 1970s. It's 28%, which is still markedly lower than I remember as a, uh, a teenager and, and younger. So what was the impact of this dramatic ageing of the population in Worthing well, as a teenager, my recollection was that all of the services and amenities were geared towards older people. I'm sure that's not the case, but you know how it is. If you go down the assembly hall and there's only a tea dance and no disco, that's what you, you tend to remember. There were bowling greens, there were residential care homes, there were bus um, groups of older people coming for weekend visits, as well as the, the resident population of older people. Um, I thought there were very few options for younger people. I, I, in fact, very, some of my earliest uh, jobs were working in service industries for older people. So I did washing up for the bowling green, which was one of the, the activities that older people tended to be involved with. And as a, a guide, I also did my service badge in a residential care home. The statistics for Worthing at the time showed that 2.5% of the pensionable population were in long-stay hospital wards and 3% were living in residential care. There were also 660 people living as permanent residents in hotels. Now that's similar to private sheltered housing that I'll come to later on in my presentation. So why did Worthing have such a plethora of residential care facilities? And why were people living permanently in hotel residences? So my first research post was in 1995 in the Centre for Social Policy Research and Development in the University of Wales, Bangor. I was employed to work on two studies, one of which was the Bangor Longitudinal Study of Ageing. Um, that study had been running since 1979, when a sample had been drawn from a cross-section of rural communities, and the primary purpose of the study was to look at the informal support networks of older people and to see how those changed over time. 
Um, the interview was conducted face to face with older people in their own homes and was repeated at four yearly intervals in various guises. It depended on the amount of funding that was achieved each year, whether it was a full interview or a shorter interview, or whether it was a subsample or the whole sample was interviewed. So when I started post-1995, we were on to the fourth data collection period. There'd been data collection in 79, 83, 87, and 95, and we did a further follow-up four years later in 99 with the super survivors, as we called them. But I'd in, uh, expressed an interest in housing before I um, got the post here. This was something I'd been interested in. Um, in my youth in Worth, in the, when there'd been a lot of homelessness issues, I was interested in getting involved in housing. So um, Claire Wenger, who was the principal investigator on this project, suggested that I might like to look at housing for older people. Um, so I started reading around the subject and quickly came across the literature on retirement migration. And this suddenly struck a chord because this apparently had been the driver of population ageing in Worthing. So one of the moves identified in the literature was a long-distance move for amenities. And this type of move captures that popular image of migration by older people, a move made at retirement age to a retirement resort, which Worthing was. And the decision to make this type of move may be way made well before retirement. Um, it's often, often triggered by a desire to change lifestyle to something that's more leisure-oriented or in search of amenities that are geared towards a particular age group. Retirement in pursuit of leisure had developed for a number of reasons. Uh, there were increases in the income of retired people, and I know there are some economists looking at pensions in the audience, so that might be something that, that you know about. Um, and there has also been increases in life expectancy. When we first had pensions introduced, people weren't expected to live long after the, the age they were entitled to receive pension. So now we have people retiring. They were likely to live longer. They were going to be in better health because we've got increases in life expectancy. So retirement became a time that could be enjoyed rather than preparing for a decline in health and essentially death, which it may have been for generations before. The destinations chosen for retirement um, have changed over the times, and, and one of the first books I read was a book by Valerie Kahn called Retiring to the Seaside, and she wrote about Becks Hill. Becks Hill was just down the road from Worthing, and in the 1970s it had the highest proportion of older people in the whole of the UK. I couldn't believe there was anywhere in the UK that had a higher proportion than Worthing, but there was. <laughs> Um, and she, she just explained how these retirement resorts had developed um, as a retirement destination. So it was that they, these places were seaside resorts originally. People might have come to visit on holiday and decided that would be a great place to go and retire to. So a lot of the South Coast resorts have become popular retirement destinations. But by the time I was reading this book, the patterns of migration had changed. And the South Coast of England was no longer the most popular places for retirement destination. The search space has changed. We know now, for example, people are retiring to the Costa Brava or other Spanish resorts. Or this sort of links in with the places that people have been on holidays. They've, they've had experiences of these places and choose to retire there in, in later life. But also there's other reasons why the south coast of England became less popular. The influx of older people had meant that house prices has, had risen out of many people's reaches. And also, for some people, the thought of actually retiring somewhere where the population is mainly made up of people of the same age actually decreases the attractiveness of the area for them. So there has also been improved communications, better road systems, which meant people could start seeking different areas to retire to. So... I'm sorry I keep going backwards. I must remember to press that button. Right, so, so my, um, a lot of people then were looking towards more rural and remote areas to retire to. So my research, when I started at CSPRD, began to focus on the new types of migration that older people might be making within rural areas. I used the data collected from Balsa over uh, 16 years to test whether two major typologies of retirement migration, which already existed, actually fitted the data we'd collected. 
Ultimately, I rejected the two existing models, which I won't go into, but in favour of a new description of migration. Um, these, these are the types of move that the data suggested were made by, by older people. We also had qualitative data which described what these moves meant um, to, to, each, uh, to two people. And today I'm not going to focus on all of these moves, but I'm just going to look at the last two moves, the low levels of assistance and high levels of assistance. Um, these, so obviously both, both are made, moves made for assistance in old age. Now there is a danger in doing this that I'm going to reinforce this negative image of ageing and I don't want to do that. Um, there's this negative image that old age is a time perfused by illness and ailments and a time of decrepitude. I'm not saying that. Look at these. There are three other types of moves. People are moving for leisure and amenities and they're making choices about moving which are the same as you and I might make throughout our lives. The sort of person that would be moving for one of these leisure-oriented moves would be typically engaged socially, civically, maybe politically, um, and undertaking leisure facilities. So the reason, really, that I'm going to focus on the assistance moves is because that's the area that housing policy is focused on. Um, so moves for assistance, then, are generally made by people who are aged 75 and over. The younger, older people are more, be, more likely to be making moves that are about amenities. The, uh, these other types of moves made by younger, older people don't need to take into account the proximity of family members, as migrators don't require physical support for members of their families. For example, people moving to, the work, to Worthing during the 1970s didn't tend to worry about the distance they moved away from other members of the family. If they needed emotional support, that could be provided over the phone. If they needed financial support, or more likely if their, or their children needed financial support, you can supply that at a distance. You don't need to be there face to face. And if there was physical support needed after a crisis, a broken arm or some you know, small period of illness, then people were able to travel to provide that. So there was no need to be in close proximity to the family. The same applies now to families. Um, in fact, communication may be even easier now with email and Skype and various other forms of, of communicating with each other. And ties between family members can be maintained over long distances. So this image of someone who's moving for improved facilities, for leisure and for amenities that are socially, scientifically and politically engaged is one that's frequently ignored and is one that we need to remember in order to reconstruct this positive, more positive image of ageing. But despite reiterating some of these positive aspects of ageing, we also have to be aware for that for some older people chronic disease may impact on their quality of life. I'm not suggesting that old age is characterised by decline, degeneration and decrepitude. However, chronic disease is the leading cause of mortality, morbidity and healthcare costs in industrialised countries. And the population pyramids that I showed you earlier show that we can expect an increasing proportion of older people and increased relative um, absolute numbers of older people as well. The increase in life expectancy is going, to, um, is going to provide challenges for people planning for preventing or dealing with chronic disease in later life. In developed countries then, older people will live with chronic diseases rather than die from them. And so it's this aspect of being able to cope with chronic disease and living with it that is important um, for both housing and for care. There are going to be some people who experience physical or mental impairment, and this means that everyday tasks become more and more difficult for them. This can often be compounded by widowhood. So, for example, for people who are married, if they um, encounter some physical impairment, a spouse often steps in and helps with tasks that they may have undertaken themselves. But if they encounter widowhood, then the chances of being able to deal with those alone uh, become much more difficult. Now, you may suppose that this isn't going to precipitate a move towards family members because we have means-tested 
community um, care avail available to older people in the UK. And this short, sort of move for help shouldn't be necessary. But there are considerable problems associated with community care. Often fixed schedules are adhered to and people are expected to either get up at the time their care worker comes round, to have meals at set time, and it gives very little freedom of choice as to what and how you plan your day ahead. There is also um, opportunities for laxity or abuse in the way that tasks are um, actually undertaken. And again, these are one of the things that are often picked up in the, in the media and highlighted when, when things go wrong in community care. Although moving closer to a family member is, is an option open to some people, it's not always a choice that's welcomed by uh, a majority of older people. And certainly the evidence that we've collected suggests that people really take into account the notion of, of burden that they might be placing on their children and don't really wish to do this. And I've got a couple of um, quotes here from the Balsa study. I'll read one of them out to you. Um, sometimes I get quivers and wonder what I'd have to do if I have to give up the house and I hate to think of it because I wouldn't like to be a burden on the children they have their lives to live and they're just beginning now to be free of the responsibility of bringing their own children up and beginning to enjoy life together and I'd hate to go down and be a burden on, on them as an old person would you see now, there's a second type of move in later life. This first one I've been talking about is perhaps in relation to widowhood, and it's a move towards either in the house with a child or living nearby to a child. But the second type of move in later life is often due to chronic, major chronic disability. And rather than moving in with or close to family members, this is likely to be into a supported living environment. Now, this might, be, might happen when there are limited kin resources. So maybe the family members have competing demands for looking after children and an older person and can't manage both tasks. Or it might be that an older person doesn't have the family available to do that or they don't want to provide care. Alternatively, as we've seen from these quotes, people might not want to place that burden on family and want to move into a supported living environment that has may be able to retain uh, some of their independence in it. So let's explore what options are available and what innovation there is in matching housing policies to older people's needs. Um, well, an, a number of different housing and care models exist within the UK which provide access to health and social care services. Models which include uh, or involve the relocation of an older person to a supported living environment include residential care, sheltered care and extra care. These three types of facilities have been developed over time in response to calls for reforms in previous housing policy and I'm going to work my way through the three types of housing to show you how research has made an impact on how those policies have been developed. Um, it's worth bearing in mind, though, that the notion that people, re that people have to relocate from their own homes to get the care and support they need has traditionally been viewed in a less positive light as remaining in, their own, in one's own home and receiving care there. So I'm going to trace the development of each support of supported living environment and look at each sort of in turn innovative housing policy as it came up. So currently in the UK, only 4% of the older population in, not in the UK, in Wales, live in residential care. As I mentioned earlier, in the 1970s, in Worthing, around 5.5% of older people lived either in residential care or long-term hospital um, facilities. Did this meet the needs of older people? Well, the effects on relocation have been the study, um, been the, the subject of study since around 1945. And there's been a, a lot of literature focusing on really the negative aspects of residential care. For a very good early account, I suggest you, you have a look at Peter Townsend's 1962 book called The Last Refuge. Um, these are some of the images from um, the research that he, he carried out. Uh, he carried out the project between 1957 and 1961. 
and his key research question was, are long-stay institutions of old people necessary in our society? And if so, what form should they take? You'll con you can see, as I carry on today, this is an enduring question that we're still asking in its various guises some uh, 40 years on, or well, nearly 50 years on, in fact. So 1955, two years before Peter Townsend started his main study, he visited a large, what was called a welfare home for the aged in London. And I've got an account that um, Peter wrote of this visit where he talked to the admitting officer for the home. And in this discussion, the adm admitting officer stressed the difference between pre-1948 and post-1948 residential care. And he said to Peter, in the old days, there was the word destitution, whatever that meant. A person got in here whether he was one week or a hundred, if he was destitute. His relatives, right up to the grandfather and down to the grandchildren, had a duty to support him. Even if the father was an old drunkard who had a son who hadn't seen him for years and who said, he's never done anything for me and I've only 50 shillings for my wife and three children, he still had to pay maybe two shillings sixpence a week. The admitting officer went on to explain the changes in his role since the introduction of the 1946 National Insurance Act and the 1948 National Health Act. And he said, now you're concerned only with the immediate situation. Your powers have all been taken away from you. If a person can't maintain himself and he's getting a bit infirm, even if there are relatives, you can't say what they should do. A young woman might say she can't look after her mother because she wants to go out to work and there's nothing you can do about it. That's half the trouble. Women want to go out to work. Now, we can't approach the children elsewhere. It's just what you find in the home when you go. But the admitting officer also pointed out that these changes between the, the um, acts coming in hadn't got themselves firmly embedded into people's minds. In their minds, the residential care home was still a workhouse or a home for the destitute. And he said, you have to implant the idea in, people's, uh, in people that the old days are dead and buried. It will take two generations, though. They think it's the old workhouse, and you have to tell them it's not like it was. It's all different now. Well, I thought it was interesting to see whether he was right. Did it take two generations for that image uh, to go? So in order to uh, look at that question, we have to look at some of the subsequent studies um, that have been con conducted in residential care. And many of these have looked at learned helplessness and the loss of control and the loss of autonomy that people have once they enter residential care. In Townsend's early study, he asked some of the residents of residential care to actually keep a daily journal of what a, a day was like in their life. And the first um, extract up here uh, is one of his typing, he typed up these uh, particular journals. And you can see at 3 p.m., bath day, waited 15 minutes in changing room, and then the attendant bathed me. I used to bathe myself at home, but we're all helped here. I suppose some of them need it. Some old people might hurt themselves on their own. Subsequently, as I said, studies have looked at how um, people have got a loss of control in residential uh, care facilities. They have, there is a decrease in the decision making or the decisions that people have been allowed to take and a loss of um, privacy. And these have contributed to falls in self-esteem of older people. Townsend coined the uh, phrase that you, you may well be aware of called structured dependency. And he put forward the thesis that dependency of older people in the 20th century was socially manufactured. He related this dependency to social structures, such as the imposition and acceptance of um, early retirement, the legitimation of low income through pensions, the denial of rights to self-determination in institutions, and the construction of community services for recipients assumed to be predominantly passive. And he said of residential care, and we've got the, the quote up here, the majority of residents in homes are placed in the category of enforced dependents. The routine of residential homes made necessary by school staffs and economical administration and committed to an ideology of care and attention 
rather than encouragement of self-help and self-management, seems to deprive many residents of the opportunity, if not the incentive, to occupy themselves and even of the means of communication. Well, 50 year, 54 years later, in 2002, we conducted a study in North Wales with a group of community dwelling older people and we asked them which aspects of a supported living environment would be important to them if they had to move into one in the future. And we examined the relative importance of various domains. These included um, privacy, physical space, um, physical care, domestic services, socialising and control over life. And we also asked people which types of accommodation they would believe would meet their needs in each of these domains. And that was a choice between residential care, sheltered housing or extra care. So we can see from this that 86% of our sample said that privacy and physical space was extremely important to them. And so was control over life, and around 81% said that that was really important to them in a future living environment. But of this sample, only 10% thought that residential care would actually meet their needs for either privacy and physical space or control over their lives. On the whole, it seems then that um, two generations on, there isn't necessarily um, an image that residential care is uh, for people who are destitute or for poor, or poor, but that there's still structured dependency. There's still this notion that any control you have over your life will be taken away from you if you move into residential care. I'll just show you one of the quotes that came up from, um, from the participants. Oh dear, oh dear, wouldn't like to be in there. The poor old things are just sitting around waiting to be fed. I couldn't go and live in there. I couldn't live with any of them. So despite an indication, yeah. Can I just ask um, about the sample, is that rural people? This was um, rural areas in North Wales and that we selected a different, um, we selected a sample that was representative of different types of rural areas. These people weren't in, uh, weren't living in supported living environments. The, the study was actually funded by Welsh Assembly in order to uh, identify some of the features of supported living that older people wanted incorporated. And as you'll see, it led on to the development of some policies that stressed certain aspects of those features that, that people were, uh, said they didn't want or that they did want. Um, so, yeah, that, that, that's what that's where that came from. So despite there's a, the indication that there is still this negative image of um, ageing, I did say one tenth did say they would that, that residential care would meet their needs. And on the whole, when we looked at the qualitative data, these people had experience of residential care and it was a positive experience. They'd had friends or relatives in a residential care facility that they thought was well run, that actually did give them control over their lives. So, so there's an indication that the, this is changing, but it's based on people's experiences. It's not enough to relate to media or this stereotypical image of residential care. You need a personal experience of it to, to change people's views. There was also a small subset, and there's 10% who thought they would, uh, that residential care would meet their needs. And these people thought that they wouldn't have a choice. If they became frail, they wouldn't have a choice where they moved. Someone would move them into residential care. Now, this involuntary movement of people into residential care is one where there's still a need for further research. Um, it seems that people are mo being moved in, in quotes, their best interests. Um, and this is primarily, it appears, to be to meet relatives, um, alleviate their anxieties about uh, the older person, rather than meeting the older person's needs themselves. And I've got an example from the earlier study, the, the Bangor Longitudinal Study, from um, Mr Williams. Mr Williams was very keen to retain his independence and this was an interview with him, a qualitative interview in 1983. Um, he said, it's nice to be independent if you can. When all's said and done, it's my independence that keeps me on my own. I'm determined to keep on, um, I'm determined to carry on as long as I can. I think my sight will let me down at the finish. 
but I haven't got enough money to go into a nursing home. I don't want to go into a nursing home. There's nothing like your own home, not to my way of thinking. When you get to 84, you think, well, you can't expect another 20 years. Well, it would be above the average, he laughs. I'll live and die here now, as far as I know. But in 1986, Mr Williams was admitted to hospital. <coughs> and he experienced uncertainty about his future. And he was actually afraid to go back to live by himself in his own home. But he stated a preference that he wanted to move home to be nearer to his family and nearer to his children. But after his hospitalisation, his children decided he would be better off in residential care. And that's where he was interviewed in 1987. Mr Williams' children hadn't given him an opportunity to discuss their decision that he was moving. Um, and it was evidently one that he wouldn't have chosen if he'd been given, been given the choice. And on leaving his home, Mr Williams said, I didn't look back, I couldn't. So in this instance, the family made the decision for people to move. But other work we've done showed that it could be other gatekeepers. So for example, um, GPs might make the decision for an older person to move. And the, the, this illustration I've given you here dates back to the 1980s. But there's more recent work by Stilwell and Kerslake in 2003. And they found that of the 15 clients they interviewed in residential care, only one said the idea to move into residential care had originated from themselves. Well, sheltered housing, moving on now, was, was developed in a backlash against this sort of a negative uh, image of residential care as, a, as an institution with, uh, where there's a lack of dignity and a, a lack of privacy. This followed the publication of Peter Townsend's book, The Last Refuge, so it's most definitely embedded in research influencing a policy uh, development. And Peter, as, as you've seen already, was outspoken in his criticism of residential care. Peter Townsend then saw sheltered housing as a positive alternative to residential care. It was an environment where he thought older people would choose to move rather than being moved by relatives or other um, gatekeepers and where they could live dignified lives while still obtaining any support that they needed. In 1970s, the sheltered housing um, policy agenda was given another boost because it came apparent to, in addition to residential care being undesirable, it was also extremely expensive. And it was recognised there were people that were living in residential care who didn't actually necessarily need the levels of care that they were being provided with. I mentioned earlier in Worthing that around 5% of the older population lived in residential care or in uh, long-term hospital facilities. But nearly 2% lived as residents in hotels. And it was well known, if you, were, you know, lived and worked in the area, that those people were using the hotels to provide themselves with the sorts of um, services you might associate with social care now. So it was, they were making the use of the opportunity to have their laundry done for them, to have their rooms cleaned, to take the opportunity to have meals delivered to the room if they needed them, or using the restaurant. Now that could be all well and good if you can afford that sort of uh, provision, but that wasn't what a majority of older people could afford. Uh, so the government encouraged local authorities to, and housing associations to develop sheltered housing. So essentially, sheltered housing is grouped accommodation which provides residents with their own homes. They have their own front doors. Um, but they also have some communal facilities. And this might be a laundry, it might be um, accommodation for guests to come and share, or it might be a common room or a lounge. Group accommodation can be small, there can be 20 units together, or it can be a large um, sheltered housing complex with 100 or more units in there. The houses are usually equipped with alarm system that may be connected to a warden, so if something happens in the, that unit, the older person can press the alarm and a warden will come and find out what's wrong. The warden can also arrange for services to be um, delivered to the person's house. They don't deliver the services themselves. Um, but currently only 5% of older people in the UK live in sheltered housing. And since the development of sheltered housing facilities, some issues have arisen that have impact on the desirability of these types of facilities. These include the location, 
the size of the properties, stigma attached to some of the properties, and issues around the undefined role of sheltered housing. If you think first about the location, well, older people often wish to stay in the community in which they, they've lived or established social networks. But the availability of local sheltered housing, especially in rural areas, and I should imagine that's the uh, case for a lot of um, rural Ireland, uh, seems to be an obstacle in, the, in place of those who wish to move. So people are wanting to stay where they are, but quite often there isn't sheltered housing in their location. Sheltered housing might be located several miles away, and usually the, the sort of towns or large villages that they're built, they have, a GP, they have access to shops and GP surgeries. But public transport, certainly in the rural areas where we live, isn't abundant, and it doesn't make it easy for people to travel between towns to visit friends who might have to move or might need to move to sheltered housing in a different location. In addition, a preference to live outside a village or a town isn't one that sheltered housing can cater to because, as I've mentioned, they're usually co-located with shops and GP surgeries. So people who are attached to their homes who have had a, perhaps a lifetime of living in a, a very rural, dispersed area don't have a choice to remain living in, in those sorts of areas. The size of the properties has also become a problem. Quite early on, the planners of sheltered housing decided what older people wanted was very small homes that are compact and easy to heat. They didn't take into account that older people have guests coming to stay, as we all usually do. They didn't put an extra bedroom for anyone to come and visit. Um, they made them so small and compact that people had to actually consider giving away or getting rid of uh, a vast uh, amount of their possessions. And certainly people I've interviewed have talked about moving into... They wouldn't move into sheltered housing because they'd have to get rid of so much stuff that they've collected over the years that they couldn't bear to part with. So, so that's become a problem. Um, and the stigma associated with uh, sheltered housing, it's become associated with the place that people move to towards the end of life. And that decreases the attractiveness of, of the complexes, if you like, for some people. Uh, consequently, because of these, these various uh, problems associated with sheltered housing, some of the uh, houses have become difficult to let and, and are becoming obsolete. The better designed ones aren't, but some of the, um, some of the very early uh, types of sheltered housing certainly have become difficult to let. Um, and it could be argued that conventional um, sheltered housing is superfluous, as what residents often require is either smaller mainstream housing with social care services and alarm systems provided within that housing. And the role of sheltered housing remains unclear. Is it about the provision of a supported living environment? Or is it primarily to, imp to imp provide improved housing or a setting for social interactions? Because a lot of sheltered housing complexes talk about you'll meet all your neighbours or you'll get to meet in the, the communal room. Well, going back to the study that I talked about earlier where we looked at these various domains, we did ask people about socialising and how important was socialising in a future supported living environment. And we can see there that although just over half of the respondents said that was important, it was nowhere near as important as, as the rest of the domains. And that's not statistically significant if you look at that compared to those who said, no, it's not, it's not important to me. For those that did say socialising was important, they tended to stress that they would like to carry on with the activities they were already engaged in. Why would they want to change what they were doing? They didn't want particularly to meet new friends. They wanted to carry on engaging with the friends they'd already got. And this a quote here says, I'd prefer, to my, to prefer my own friends and to organise my own social life. I don't think age stops you having fun. We also looked at physical care and how important that was in a supported living environment. And we can see here that 82% thought this was um, extremely important. Um, over half of the sample thought that sheltered housing would meet their needs for physical care. And people, preferred, people who said that they preferred sheltered housing as um, an option felt that having a warden on call or knowing that someone was nearby was very important to them. 
and that they would be able to access services through the warden um, but retain their independence. And typical sorts of uh, responses to this were we would still have our privacy but could ring the warden if we got ill and I could still have a home help and meals or wheels visit. But what became apparent as we started reading through the, the qualitative data um, was that people didn't really understand what sheltered housing could and couldn't provide. It suggests that in addition to preferences being um, affected by a negative image of particular supported living environments, it was also um, affected by a lack of knowledge about particular living environments. Uh, many didn't understand the limitations of sheltered housing, and that's namely that they can't provide care for very frail older people. Um, people have to move on if they need a lot of um, health or medical care. And this reinforces the point I made earlier, that the role of sheltered housing remains unclear. It hasn't been defined in policy. People don't know what they should, are able to receive, where the scene lines, where, when they would be expected to move on from that, um, from, that, the, from that environment. Now, despite the lack of clarity around provision of care and what, uh, what residential care is meant to provide or, and what sheltered housing is meant to provide, the next innovation in housing policy actually focuses on this aspect. And extra care sheltered housing looked at the provision of physical care in a supported living environment. So currently, there's a great deal of interest in extra care housing. Um, it's innovative housing for older people that can combine high levels of care with independent living. And since the 1980s, this new form of housing, which is co either called extra care or very sheltered housing, has been on the policy agenda. It broadly differs from sheltered housing in that there's, um, they provide a meal or meals on site. There's provision of additional health and social support services. The facilities are usually built um, with a barrier-free environment and some of them make the most of um, ICT within those environments. They're meant to provide a larger living space than sheltered housing provided and um, extra disposable income for tenants because of the way that housing benefits and other benefits can be worked around. They're also meant to be a vibrant community, so including people with a mixed um, ranges of impairment and also flexible packages of care. So the intention is that if people's needs for care increase, so does their package of care, but also if they then get better or rehabilitated, then those packages decrease, unlike the sort of situation we might have seen in residential care um, previously. Now, this type of housing in Wales is one that, um, that the Welsh Assembly Government has been really keen to develop. Um, and they've, we, they've done this, in, in, um, they've noted their support, if you like, for extra care housing through a variety of policy initiatives. And in 2003, the st strategy for older people in Wales aimed to promote an adequate supply of special forms of <coughs> housing which meet the varying and changing needs of older people and ensure that they can remain independent as long as possible. In 2005, Designed for Life stated that specialist housing where care services available on site would become a much more widespread alternative to residential homes, even for people with quite severe needs. And in 2006, the National Service Framework for Older People recognised that home need not be the same house within which older people have lived for years. Other housing options such as sheltered housing, retirement villages or extra care housing can enable older people to retain their independence. And finally, in 2007, in Fulfilled Lives Supported Communities, the Welsh Assembly suggested that extra care is a model of care that fits well in Wales. There are a range of facilities in extra care that promote participation and well-being. And in order to go some way to meeting all these pledges that they'd made in um, policy documents, they actually have spent um, 41 million, or pledged 41 million pounds, for the provision of extra care housing. The guidelines for developing extra care housing in Wales state that extra care schemes should take into consideration the likely impairments 
that residents will face with increasing age and frailty. But to date, there's been few research projects that have actually looked at extra care facilities and seen what, what do they provide? Are they doing what it says on the tin, or aren't they? Most of these uh, studies have been conducted in, in England. Um, one of these is uh, uh, by a colleague, um, Miriam Bernard, um, at Keele University. She's been doing some work with um, Berry Hill uh, retirement community. Um, and she's found that frail people didn't benefit as much as fit older people in extra care facilities. And she suggested that the extra care was actually providing housing with support rather than housing with care, which is essentially quite a different thing. Um, whilst it appeared to be successful and working for those people who were fairly fit and able, for those people who were frail, they were becoming increasingly isolated from other people within the communal facility. There's also been concern that extra care uh, might form, if you like, almost a ghetto of older people with decreased increased levels of dependency and frailty in one place. But another study by Kingston um, et al. has found that over the course of a year, people living in extra care managed to maintain both their physical and mental health. So despite the commitment by the Welsh Assembly Government to the provision of extra care, they do recognise that they don't know if it provides what they want it to provide. And they say currently we do not know whether extra care accommodates the changing needs of both fit and frail older people. We have no knowledge of whether they successfully manage the delivery of complex integrated health and social care packages. Because they don't know what's going on in extra care, they have funded the Centre for Innovative Ageing, which is the centre I direct, to undertake some research. Um, and in this research, we are comparing older people living in extra care facilities with those living in residential care and those receiving complex care packages in the community. And we're comparing the costs of care in each of the three settings and the levels of frailty of the people in each of the three, um, each of the three settings. And we're using both quantitative and qualitative methodologies to explore whether extra care can, in fact, accommodate the changing needs of uh, frail older people. Um, we're, we're looking at quality of life and we're also seeking the views of the care managers in their environment to see if they believe that those packages of care can or cannot be delivered. And we're doing some cost effectiveness work as well. Okay, I'm on to the last uh, bit now. That's the, this is our, the sample that we're, we're, we're looking at. Um, I'm just to focus on frailty very briefly. These are the measures of frailty we're looking at, but the last um, item on there, cognition, we're building on a definition of frailty that's being used by um, medics elsewhere, and typically this is looking at physical measures of frailty, and they ignore mental um, frailty. So we've included um, the mini mental state examination to look at um, mental frailty of older people. Now we haven't got um, data yet because we're halfway through data collection but if you want to get our, see our results come along to the British Society of Gerontology annual conference this September when we'll be presenting them. But for now what I'd just like to give you a little taster of what the um, staff have been talking or telling us about um, and what our first impressions through the qualitative data are. It appears that the extra care facilities can provide for physically frail older people, but there are differences in how they provide that. Some sites are providing on-care healthcare professionals, on-site, some sites are on-site healthcare professionals, whereas others are providing health as the same way you'd get it as if you were living in the community. So, for example, a community nurse or a GP visiting. So essentially, what's the difference between that and getting community care? Um, but it does appear they cannot or tend not to be able to deal with people who have cognitive impairment. And um, we've already ha heard of stories about they, they can't manage this because people wander out of the facilities and they lose them, or they start knocking on the doors of other people living in the facility, or there's other antisocial behaviour. Um, or, the, or they become increasingly isolated as other people don't want to mix with people with cognitive impairment. Now, it might be that extra care isn't the best place to provide care for people with dementia, 
or it might be that these facilities need to work through how they're going to deliver care properly in extra care facilities. Um, my biggest bugbear at the moment is they are being sold or rented out as facilities that provide care to people to the end of life. Um, and here is an example of an advertisement that suggests very clearly that you would be able to move into this facility and stay there, whatever your level of impairment. How long have I got, Gemma? Do you want me to stop now? Right. <laughs> this is still, there is a failure to define what extra care is about. What are they meant to be doing that's different than sheltered care? Is it just the provision of a meal? If so, why are people going to move to extra care? Why don't they stay in the community and why don't we just deliver meals to people in the community? If it's about on-site healthcare provision, then there needs to be guidelines to say that's what extra care provides. If they're selling themselves and providing care for people with mental frailty, then they need to be providing it. And at the moment, they certainly aren't. So, in conclusion, there are three models of supported living environments. Each has been an innovative response to something that's happened before. Um, but policy has continued to fail to define what those types of um, environments are meant to provide. And in the future, is extra care going to become like sheltered housing? Is there going to be a stigma associated with it? What essentially is the major difference between that and, and, and sheltered housing? I won't go into the problems associated with the description of sheltered housing, but you can imagine sheltered, a little bit negative, doesn't quite fit in with these ideas of autonomy and, and independence, so there may be problems around that. And I still, we, think, we still need to think about what are the best methods of delivering care to older people in supported living environments. And that's me done. And I think I might have time for questions, do I? And it's, it's in um, a very remote rural area in Wester Ross, and that was an initiative where there was a local minister who was looking at you know, older people having to move away to get any type of support or, or care. So he consulted with everyone in that um, area, and they decided what they needed there was a mixture of different types of housing. So they've got several extra care houses, they've got some sheltered houses for people who want to move to those, they've also got some medical beds for acute medical um, emergencies, but they, they de deliver peripatetic services from that centre, so the staff there can deliver to the community as well. They also house a library and they're into intergenerational work, so that model of care was in response to the local needs. Everyone knows what's available and they have a proper choice over what they get and whether or not they want to do that or they want to stay in their home. So I think in terms of innovation, certainly policymakers could take a leaf out of you know, that local um, uh, group as to the way ahead and respond to local needs. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. I found that very interesting. Um, I want to comment in terms of people who are moving um, or to retire in the seaside town. Was there a sense or has there been much looked at in terms of connectedness to place? Because in Ireland, um, some small piece of work that I have done showed a huge unwillingness and resistance among a lot of people to actually physically move, both from their place and their locality and their friends. So what they wanted was services to come to them rather than they have to move. Absolutely. And in terms of comments on the retirement village, um, there was a, a great sense among older people that they didn't want to be loved together and that even the notion of retirement villages where older people were just um, connected together or cared for together or a facility was relevant where people could move to, that that wasn't what they wanted. They wanted to remain in the town, in the rural area and remain there all their lives. And I thought it was interesting that Mr. Williams said there's nothing like their own home. Mm. Well, it's, it's that very work that's led me on to, uh, I've done a lot of work around attachment to place. That's my, my, one of my uh, key interests. And it's because people are saying, I want to remain rooted in my place. I, I've been looking at what are the different elements that attach a person to place. And mm. um, I think I was talking to Gemma last night, that there, I think there might be some similarities between Ireland and Wales. In certainly in some areas with the um, local culture, uh, language issues, not wanting to be moved because of historical attachment to place. For other people it's about 
purely about social networks, some is historical, some, and, the, and, it, and interestingly, it's the people who do this long distance migration who are interested in the scenery. And they've moved there because perhaps it's a coastal view or it's a mountainous view. So their attachment to place is expressed differently than those people who are rooted for different reasons in their place. So maybe we need to talk later and I'll refer you to some of the, the, the papers I've written about that if you're interested. <laughs> Yeah, interesting. I, I, I've worked um, in some of these, uh, well, I've worked in India uh, look, looking at rural areas, and it was one of the areas I was quite interested in with this idea that the revered elder as a source of wisdom. Um, and to a, to a certain extent, I was quite, if you like, disappointed that that wasn't the case in a lot of rural areas I visited. Um, I, I'm, I don't know an awful lot about this area, and I know you've got colleagues here who are writing about wisdom and old age who would be much more qualified to answer anything on this. But, but for me, it, I think the struggle for resources over arches, um, if you like, if you haven't got your resources there, then this notion of wisdom, I think, is... Um, is, is slightly above what, if, if, if every day is about looking for resources to eat or to live, then the notion of an older person being a source of wisdom isn't something people are going to seek because they're, they're struggling for other things. And if you think about if we're struggling for resources for education or, you know, it, within a welfare state, is wisdom something we're looking at? And as a society, maybe how do we, how do, we do that? How do, we, how do we get towards self actualization as a society, which I think perhaps wisdom is more about that? But I can't answer it. Sorry. <laughs> Ryan and then Wendy. Yeah, I'd like to know how old is old. Because I, I very often think that, that, that we, we usually think that the, the others are older. I am younger than, than the others. Yeah. And so, so how old is old and how old is the person who, who somehow wants to belong to the, old, to the other old? Mm -hmm. Well, how old you are. <laughs> and policy defines old at the end of the day I mean you don't personally it's always someone else who's older it's, in Wales for example the, the, they define old as different depending on which policy you look at so the strategy for older people in Wales is 55 plus Be yeah and that was because they wanted to capture that period of where people might be leaving employment before they retire but that period is also very difficult because, it's, if you like, it's an older person trying to get back into work if they become um, redundant or lost their job. So they wanted to capture that. So there was a reason for starting at 55. <laughs> but, yeah. Do you just consider the positive as positive as possible? Wendy. Yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, if you talk to people in the extra care living environments, they, they, they enjoy they are enjoying them, and there's some really lovely facilities. But the, I mean, I guess, again, I didn't want to reinforce this negative image of ageing, but the difficulty is when you move there, you might be young and fairly fit, and there's lots of lovely social activity. Some of the buildings are absolutely gorgeous. One of the ones I visited a couple of weeks ago is this fantastic uh, glass atrium. They have cream teas outside. There's a place to play balls at one end and a bowling green at the other end. Absolutely gorgeous. And people are enjoying living there. They have their own gardens. They're growing their own veg. But if they are staying there and then become increasingly fair, what happens then? Does it still provide for them later on? And, and that's the issue, I think, at the moment. It's this future scenario is all well and good if you're fairly fit and maybe a little bit physically frail, but it's what happens if you get cognitive decline. Well, it's the, commun the communal stuff, but there's also this option to shut your door 
and do what you like. So there was, I mean, there's, there's one in England we visited, which used to be um, the Vintners Association. Um, uh, what it? it was, I think it was residential care originally, and they've changed it now to sheltered living. So the best bit about that for a lot of the residents was the pub. They were all ex-pub landlords, and they loved the pub. So it, you know, it depends on the mix of the people that you've got there. Um, and certainly the, the, the wardens uh, and the managers of the places recognise that the whole um, ethos of a place might change if you get certain different residents. And, and one I was talking to last week knew that there were some community activists moving in. There were a, part, there were a pair coming in. She said, oh, well, things are going to change now. We'll have all sorts of other social activities. Because the managers don't really want to organise activities on behalf of the residents. They'd rather that the residents said, we'd like to do this, we'd like a space to do this. And she thought, well, th you know, the next few months it was going to change completely. So it'd be interesting to revisit and see what's happened yeah, there. Really yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much. examples in the Bolsa study of how people adapted to meet their own needs yeah. within the house they were in. So they didn't have to move the house. And that might mean moving everything downstairs yeah. rather than getting stair lifts because a lot of the, um, a, a, one of the difficulties with some of the um, new build housing was that they never built walls strong enough to have stair lifts, for example. So um, that, that was a difficulty. So people might move everything downstairs. And we got some wonderful stories of how people got uh, grants to get what was a, a disused outside toilet and then have that built into an extension and, and use, you know, have a downstairs um, bathroom. So there were people adapting to that. There were people who adapted their behaviours um, and managed things in a way we might think as abnormal, but I think I mentioned to you about someone who had to climb the stairs and she crawled the stairs, but she was happy doing that. She felt if that meant she could stay in her house and go up and down doing that, then she was happy to be there. In relation to moving, though, I mean, one of the things that hasn't come out in this, there are a lot of people who move throughout their lives quite regularly, and there's no reason that people stop doing that when they're older. So th there are some people yet who become very attached to a place for a variety of reasons, but there are also people, I perhaps you could call them chronic movers, because they've, they've always done it and, and will continue to do so, I think. Yeah. We better go and have our coffee break, or they have sold us off to the other conference. So, uh, can I thank you so much, Vanessa, for coming over. Oh, that's right. Thank you.